This is Harvard on the Map, presented by the Harvard Graduate School of Design, covering innovative ideas and thought leaders in digital cartography, earth observation, and all things geospatial, with your host, Jennifer Horowitz. Hello, and welcome to Harvard on the Map. I'm here with Patrick Cozy, the CEO of Cesium. And I'm so lucky to have you on the program. Thanks for being here. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, well, so to start, um, for Boston listeners who may not understand the work of Cesium, um, would you go into some detail about the work that Cesium does? Sure, yeah. So at Cesium, we're building an, an open platform to empower software developers to build experiences using 3D geospatial data, right? We see so much 3D geospatial data being acquired from satellites, aircraft, drones, cell phones, and, and we've built uh, software components to make it e easier for software developers to, to use that, that data, almost like, kind of like a game engine, but for the real world. And, you know, especially someone who's in the geospatial arena, Cesium is I mean, more than famous. It's a, a household name, <laughs> geospace, and it's, it's such a, a pleasure to have you on the program. Um, so um, you mentioned Cesium's a platform with 3D data. Um, one of the things that I think um, would also be be great is is to describe how what 3D tiles are, what, what are 3D map tiles, and how do they differ from 2D map tiling systems? Sure, yeah, we put a ton of work into this because uh, 3D and 2D and the geospatial world are, are really quite quite different. Uh, so in addition to building software components, we also do a lot of work on formats and open standards, right, to get data from point A to point B and to do that really efficiently. Uh, so in the world of 2D, uh, those in the geospatial community are generally pretty familiar with map tiles, like what you might see in WMTS, and the idea that you might have a giant image of the entire world, and then you, you slice it into four, then you take each of those and you slice that into four. Then as I pan around a 2D map, maybe on a web browser, it only needs to pull in a subset of those tiles, right? So in 3D, the world becomes pretty interesting because you can tilt, you can quote, tilt that map, uh, and it's not flat, right? It's a ellipsoid, it's a WGS84 ellipsoid. So you might actually have multiple levels of detail, different tiles at different resolutions in the same view, right? So we created 3D tiles to take techniques from computer graphics and computer, uh, uh, to take techniques from computer graphics and uh, video games and apply them to 3D geospatial data. Uh, using things like spatial subdivision, mesh decimation, texture atlasing, and 3D tiles defines a, a general purpose spatial subdivision, and then a very efficient 3D payload uh, based on the Kronos Open Standard GLTF. And it allows us to take lots of different types of 3D geospatial data, like point clouds, photogrammetry models, uh, 3D buildings from CAD, and then to organize them very efficiently efficiently so they can be streamed uh, to a runtime engine, such as something in a, a web browser. Uh, well, I mean, for as someone who, there, there was a, a class I took a while back, it was on uh, GPU and programming. And uh, and I, I remember one of my my books, I can't even remember which one had, it was written by you, I, I believe. And I, I, you know, I feel like I, I can't imagine anyone to uh, taking on this, this very, very complicated concepts of, of bringing in all these different things, 3D geometry, CAD models, everything into one, one platform. I, I'm, it's really, I know I said it in the beginning, but it's an honor to have you here. Um, I, uh, I, I wondered, I wondered um, what to your mind has been the, the most unique or surprising um, use of CZM's 3D software. Wow, thanks. Yeah, first I'm flattered on your your interest in, in cesium and, and 3D tiles. It's certainly been a fun a fun journey for us, and I still think we're very early in kind of realizing the potential of 3D geospatial data. Uh, as far as unique use cases, so there's there's one that I kind of consider a classic, right? So we started cesium in the aerospace and defense world with the earliest use cases being, you know, global view where you see the Earth spinning and then you see satellites orbiting the earth. Um, 
when we made it open source, I mean, something really magical happened where folks outside of aerospace and defense had a need for this global scale, high fidelity, real world visualization tool set. Uh, and one of the ones I love most that picked it up was actually Red Bull, right? So think about that. If you're used to primarily doing aerospace and defense applications, and then suddenly Red Bull is picking up the same technology. Uh, and this is to do um, a playback and real time view of the X Alps. We have athletes that are racing, paragliding and hiking through the Swiss Alps. And then, you know, they have time tagged position, right? And having that streamed and then put in the real world train and imagery. I just thought it was so, so cool and really opened up our eyes to the breadth of use cases we could serve. Wow, that, I, I had never even seen that one. That's very cool. I didn't, didn't know that at all. Yeah, I, I, I think for, for me, my, my, uh, my personal favorite, perhaps, I did see a, a wonderful uh, surf, surfing cesium story map, which I know that, that the story maps are not, you know, not the 3D platform, but they, they are another wonderful part of the cesium offerings. Um, but um, another thing that I also, another one that I also loved was the, the, the Unreal Engine and, uh, and cesium partnership as I'm a big gamer and it's, it's really, really cool to see. So I'd, I'd love if you could maybe tell our Boston listeners a little bit more about, about that platform and, uh, or about that partnership. Sure. Yeah. We're really excited to be working with, with Epic Games and to be bringing cesium to Unreal Engine. Uh, and I also started in gaming and I did a lot of game development when I was in high school, kind of way back with QBasic and Turbo Pascal and some C and assembly. So that's, that's really what brought me into computer science and, and eventually into geospatial. Um, so in the early days of Cesium, you know, we built Cesium JS as a bespoke rendering engine, JavaScript and WebGL. And I wrote the original rendering engine for it. As time went on, we saw that there was huge opportunity to take game engines and to kind of geospatial enable them, if you will, right? And then we got interest through uh, the use of 3D tiles and the Army One World Terrain program. And people are like, well, geez, we kind of want 3D tiles everywhere, right? Not just in Cesium JS. And that's when we started working through, uh, working with Epic Games through a great program they have. It's called the Epic Mega Grant, uh, well, where you can put in proposals and they will fund lots of different types of projects, uh, including student projects as well. So it could be really, really interesting for the community there at, at Harvard. Uh, and that's when we wrote a 3D tiles loader that we now call Cesium for Unreal. So you can bring in using the open standard, the community standard from OGC, 3D tiles. You can bring in global terrain. You can bring in photogrammetry models. You can bring in 3D buildings. Uh, and that's the same content that we also serve to Cesium JS. Wow, I didn't know about that program. Also, that's really interesting. So, so it sort of came out of this 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 program. And so, what have been some of the more um, have you have you seen some of the 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 user base of cesium using it in interesting ways? Is there anything that you you've seen that you thought, wow, so you know, I haven't never really expected that to, yeah, in creative different creative ways of using it, yeah. Yeah, so in, in building Cesium for Unreal Engine and working with Epic Games, you know, I think our eyes have been open up both from a kind of, we made like 30 years progress overnight, right? When you build that bridge from 3D geospatial to Unreal Engine, suddenly all of the amazing rendering that they put in Unreal Engine, you know, the volumetric clouds, the stunning atmosphere, boom, it just works, right? So that was just really, really transformational, I think. And then it also opens up all these new channels and all this large developer community that's already using Unreal Engine, but potentially has a need right for 3D geospatial data, start through 3D tiles. So we saw almost immediately uh, folks building flight simulators, for example, uh, that where they could take advantage of, of Unreal Engine's blueprint to very quickly script. We thought were really stunning. And then we also saw some interesting uh, historical recreations of sites, uh, then even showing, like for example, a historic flood and how that impacted the area. Uh, so it's really it's really fun to see how creative that community is and how fast they can develop with Unreal Engine. Yeah, I'd encourage listeners to go onto the website and, and see some, because I think visually that's why, where Cesium is the most impactful when you really see the output of, of, of Cesium JS or the Unreal Engine partnership. It's, it's really beautiful visually to see. Um, yeah, so you, you mentioned 
um, this commitment to, to open source software um, earlier, and, and uh, I wonder where the genesis of that that stemmed out of, and um, is, is that a personal interest to you, or um, yeah, where that comes from? Yeah, it's a huge, huge personal interest to me, and I think when when you're building software for other software developers, uh, that creating open source really helps accelerate things, really helps build trust, really helps build community, and I think it should be a key part of of kind of any software stack. Uh, I think my original interest in open source was uh, I co-authored a book called 3D Engine Design for Virtual Globes uh, with Kevin Ring, who's also at Cesium. Uh, and we wrote a little 3D geospatial engine for that book. It's on GitHub. I believe it's called Mini Globe. Uh, it's still there. It's in C Sharp and OpenGL. Uh, it predates Cesium JS. Uh, and we made that, that engine open source, right? And at the time, we read a book uh, that's free online. It's called Producing Open Source Software. That's all about how do you run you know, a healthy and open open source project. It's an amazing book. And we just kind of followed it to a T. And we got really interested in that. So then when we're starting to develop Cesium JS at AGI, which traditionally is a COX, a commercial software company, you know, we kind of pitched and said, hey, what would you think about making Cesium JS open source? Uh, kind of use that to maybe get into some new markets and see what types of new things people would build with it. And hey, it's JavaScript, so it's always gonna, it's gonna get delivered to your browser as source code anyway. Uh, and that was kind of the genesis and now I mean, open source is so foundational to what we do at, at Cesium, both you know, from a community enablement strategy and even from a business strategy. So we put a lot of our investment in the open source software, uh, as well as supporting and creating uh, and building communities around open standards uh, to enable interoperability, right? We think there's a lot of potential with 3D geospatial. No one vendor can do it all, right? So each vendor, each company, each organization should focus on what they're best at, what they're most important, what's most important to them, and then have interoperability so that data can flow and, and allow folks to build their ultimate solution. Wow. Well, I guess I, I speak on behalf of the developer community. It's 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 great that you 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 value open source source software so so heavily and and uh, it shows. I mean, so I I'm curious in your view, what is the future for for CZM holds? Uh, I'm I'm excited to see it, but what do you, what do you, how do you how do you see it? But yeah, I'm super excited for, for the future. Uh, I think there's a few things that are of, of big interest. So, so one, you know, we talked a little bit about the journey from Cesium JS, the WebGL engine that started Cesium, uh, to Cesium for Unreal Engine. And as part of making Cesium for Unreal Engine, we made an open source project called Cesium Native. Uh, that's a general purpose 3D tile streaming engine and will allow us to bring 3D tiles to many other runtime engines. Uh, so for example, we're working with uh, the Linux Foundation and AWS on bringing 3D tiles into O3DE, the Open 3D Engine. In fact, they're having a conference right now uh, that, that we have some folks presenting at. Uh, so we wanna bring 3D tiles to as many different types of runtime engines as possible so the developer community has their choice of, of tools and then they can import 3D tiles from any source that generates it, and then from our Cesium Ion uh, cloud platform. Uh, so that's one area that we're really interested in. Uh, the other area is, you know, we do see a big movement toward towards the metaverse, kind of this extension of the internet uh, that is fundamentally 3D immersive, persistent, and, and connects us. Uh, and we really do feel that we're at a dawn of a very exciting era, right, that has VR, AR wearables, and we have all this compute power in the cloud and at edge and all these components like game engines. Uh, and we really wanna ensure that the metaverse is open and is interoperable. Uh, so a lot of our open standards work plays to supporting that as well. In your view, um, what can, uh, can geospatial developers uh, learn from gaming developers? It's this very, it's this interesting intersection. And I, I wonder in your view, what you, what you feel the, the geo community can learn from the gaming community? I think there's so much synergy between the geo and gaming communities. And, and in some ways, I kind of describe, you know, my personal journey and, and Cesium as applying computer games and computer graphics techniques to geospatial problems, right? And we fundamentally look at 3D geospatial 
you know, as a computer graphics problem, uh, the same way that, you know, someone developing tools for a movie or for a game, look at something that's inherently 3D. Um, so anything that's around uh, spatial subdivision that's being used in games and movies, I think applies very well to the geospatial world. Uh, we also see uh, the game engine starting to come of age doing uh, really high precision, large scale rendering, right? Which I think is also very relevant to the, um, uh, to the gaming community or to the geospatial community. And then likewise, you see in the gaming world, they develop very sophisticated content pipelines, right? To take kind of raw data through to the, the final source uh, for delivery. So there's a ton of synergy in both directions. Well, I appreciate that uh, in part for my, my thesis and also because I think it's very interesting for our listeners. And um, yeah, so at the end of my interviews, I ask all of my interviewees, um, given the geo theme of the show to describe a time uh, where you were lost, whether that was physically or, um, you know, in your life or career, uh, and metaphorically so, and, uh, and, and how you found your way back again. Oh, cool. that's a fun question. Uh, and I look forward to reading your thesis. Please send it my way when it's, cool. when it's ready uh, for this question. So it's pretty, it's pretty fun. So one, I don't know that I was lost, but one interesting story you may enjoy was uh, my friend and I, when we were an undergrad at Penn State, uh, we drove across the country, essentially from Philadelphia uh, to LA uh, with a detour all the way down in New Orleans and then in Oklahoma City. And this was in probably 2003, uh, before cell phones. And we had an atlas, right? Like a big book that was a, you know, a map of the US. And we were in Oklahoma City and we were gonna drive nonstop to LA. And we were trying to figure out what was the fastest route, right? What, what highway should we take? And we took a shoelace and we laid it across the, the two different routes we were considering to try to then figure out how many miles each one was, right? So I don't know that we were lost, but we were trying to find the most efficient route, you know, way before we do that with, uh, with Google Maps. Wow, that's funny. So you, you just like laid the, 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 the shoelace out on the map, that's funny. Yeah, we let to, to fit the curve of the roads. Yeah. And then, we straightened, then we straightened it out and saw how many inches was it. Wow, nice. Well, did you make it there on did you make it there on time and and efficiently at least? I think we took like 25 hours from wow. o- from Oklahoma City to LA if I remember nice. correctly. <laughs> That's impressive. Well, thank you for your time again. This has been such a pleasure and um, I look forward to talking again. Um, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you Jennifer. Appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah. Great having you. Okay. Talk to you soon.